Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi. The attempted coup in Turkey may have been crushed, but has it exposed weaknesses in President Erdogan's hold on power? Around 15,000 personnel from the military, police, judiciary and civil service have either been arrested or relieved from duty. My guest is Deputy Prime Minister Mehmet Şimşek. Isn't President Erdogan the target of the coup, too polarizing a figure for Turkey, and is his grip on power weaker than it seems? Deputy Prime Minister Mehmet Şimşek in Ankara, welcome to Hard Talk. What an extraordinary time for Turkey. Nearly 300 people dead. We've had clashes on the streets between the police, mutinous soldiers, civilians, 1,500 wounded. The parliament in Ankara was bombed and President Erdogan hunted down by mutinous troops. This coup, had it been better organised, frankly, could have succeeded, couldn't it? Well, thank you. Um, yes, it was really uh, an extraordinary night, uh, in a, a really big nightmare, and certainly it seems that this was quite an, an elaborate attempt to essentially get rid of a democratically elected government. Um, I think uh, with details coming out, certainly a fairly elaborate attempt, and we've been very lucky to escape. And I think not lucky, but I think people stood up for democracy and people, I think, were so courageous. Uh, this will probably go down in history where unarmed people stood up to tanks and planes and armed gangsters, rogue elements within the army and prevented a disruption in Turkish democracy. And hopefully that will prevent future attempts, not only in Turkey, but also in other emerging democracies. Okay, you were it's in a, your... probably a source of inspiration. Okay, you were in your constituency. Were you worried? Were you worried for your safety, for instance? Yes, of course. No, um, here's how things developed. I was uh, in my constituency, which is Gaziantep, nearly two million population and hosting 350,000 Syrian refugees. I was there with the OECD Secretary General. We were about to conclude our programs at night and head to the airport to fly to Istanbul. And uh, the chief of security and governor said they wanted to have a word with me and they mentioned that there were unusual movements of troops and that these might actually be the beginning of a military coup. Of course, that was shocking. But very quickly, I said, look, we have to fight these off, so let's set up a crisis management center. You do this, I do this, and I ended up actually going to what we call Democracy Square, and within hours, we had a quarter of a million people there, and literally, I think that massive show has prevented the local general from getting out of his uh, military camp. All right, so you're talking very much about people power, and we certainly saw people in the streets. But that was also a very worrying aspect of what happened, because basically, in some cases, we saw lynch mobs turning on some of the soldiers. And some of these soldiers, as you know, Deputy Prime Minister, were just teenagers, privates. Apparently, they thought they were just taking part in military exercises, not an attempted coup. There was even a report of one soldier having his throat slit. Are you going to investigate this kind of mob justice? Absolutely. And your last bit is, by the way, was incorrect. There is no what is throat slit, by the way, that was a misreporting, it's already been falsified, but certainly we cannot approve of such acts, but imagine, you know, uh, an army of a country, uh, you know, rogue elements within the army, essentially having tanks, aeroplanes, attacking people, civilians, 
and the parliament and other sort of uh, security forces. So you can imagine the atmosphere. Of course, maybe mistakes were made, but clearly the biggest crime was to turn military guns on people, on democratically elected uh, parliament and, and government. Okay, because President Erdogan has said that the plotters now, so moving to the plotters, will pay a heavy price, and he's talked of restoring the death penalty in Turkey. Is that going to happen? No, no decision has been made on death penalty. Certainly we are responding to massive public pressure to reinstate death penalty. My government had eliminated death penalty to, to, to achieve EU accession talks uh, back at the beginning of the last decade. So no decision has been made, but let's face it. I think perpetrators of this failed coup have to face the, the full force of justice. Otherwise, it will be a huge injustice to Turkish people to Turkish democracy. Okay, but let's but just clarify. We have to stay within the rules. Sorry to law. interrupt you here, but just let's clarify the death penalty um, question because, you know, Federica Mogherini, the EU foreign policy chief, has said no country that wishes to join the European Union can have the death penalty on its statute books. And yet you've got the president here saying he's talking of restoring the death penalty. Is he just playing to the gallery then, trying to whip up sentiment? No, I'm just saying that today Prime Minister was on the record making it very clear that while he understands public demand for reinstating death penalty, that this is not a, a foregone conclusion, that in these constitutional amendments that we do not have the qualified majority to do so, that this has to be discussed at the Parliament and with uh, you know, elements of society. So it will be debated so in Parliament? Saying, that no decision has been made. No, I understand you say no decision no, has been I mean, made, but can I'm you just... tell us, will it be debated no. in Parliament? It will be debated in Parliament, the restoration think... of the death penalty? There may... there may be consultations on whether or not, very in a narrow way, whether something that should be reintroduced. But uh, again, uh, even that has not been decided. All right, and there's another concern that President Erdogan will see what's gone on as a kind of blank check to move against all his opponents, regardless of whether they might have been implicated in the attempted coup or not. Isa Bingo, an Istanbul-based human rights lawyer, says, we're talking about arrest warrants issued for thousands of people. How were they issued based on what facts? Is it a kind of witch hunt? Is it, Deputy Prime Minister? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Let me please give you some backdrop to that. We were actually in the process. We've already identified, you know, elements of judiciary that were already, you know, Gulen movement, sort of remnants of Gulen movement. And we think they may also be complicit in this failed coup attempt. So, in fact, there was already a comprehensive uh, sort of work on those who were sympathizers or involved in these illegal acts, in these rogue activities. So there was already a process. That process was accelerated to reduce the risk of the additional threat on the back of this military coup. Plus, uh, as far as military is concerned, all along we knew that there was a very significant presence of uh, Gulen movement, uh, you know, uh, people in the army. And in fact, in early August, there was a plan to retire most of them from military position because every year you get uh, basically a military high council gathering that decides who to promote, who to right. retire. So we get, the, we get the answer. We get the answer. You're saying that the 15,000 or so officials who've either been arrested or have been relieved from duty or suspended from duty, it, you're just accelerating that process. But I have to put it to you that one of the judges who's been suspended is Al Parslan Altan. Now, he headed a panel ruling in 2014 that said Turkey's ban on Twitter was a breach of the Constitution. He's a member of the Constitutional Court, the country's highest legal body. It's that kind of person who's included in the arrests. How would you defend his arrest, for instance? I mean, not his arrest, well, his being suspended well, from duty. Uh, 
please, you cannot take things out of context. Let's face it. We do have what appear to be a religious movement run by a retired preacher out of Pennsylvania that has penetrated in hierarchy of judiciary, military, intelligence, police, ministry of finance, entire state apparatus. And that's why we call parallel state. I don't believe that any country would tolerate such a rogue state, rogue elements within the state. And let's face it, the carnage that this military coup has triggered, has caused, and had it been successful, what sort of you know, setback Turkey it, would have, you know, taking Turkey back to dark days of military I have to interrupt you here, and, though, Deputy Prime Minister. OK, so you and your government are all pointing the finger at Fethullah Gulen, who is this cleric in his mid-70s, um, suffering from heart disease, diabetes, lived in Pennsylvania, once an ally of President Erdogan, then fell out with him a few years ago. He has said he completely denies any involvement or that of his supporters in the failed coup attempt. I just want to make that clear. Do you have the evidence that he was or his supporters were involved in the attempted coup? Well, let me just give you one simple piece of evidence that has been uncovered just two nights ago. Uh, in one of the tanks that was attacking Istanbul uh, police headquarters, we arrested a gentleman who was sacked from Turkish police units a few years ago for affiliation with Gulen movement, and he was in military uniform. Now, let me ask you a simple question. What would a civilian who has been sacked from police force a few years ago do in military uniform in a government, in a, in a military tank, attacking Turkish police headquarters? Well, it doesn't Just necessarily mean that he's anything to do with Fethullah Gulen, because you know what the Americans say. John Kerry, the US Secretary of State, has said to you, to Turkey, we have always said, give us the evidence. We need a solid legal foundation that meets the standard of extradition in order for our courts to approve such a request, because your government is asking that the cleric be extradited from Pennsylvania. So the Americans are saying, give us the evidence. Why don't you give it to them? Fe Fair enough. We are actually going to give them the evidence. We're going to add the latest evidence to the file as well. The Justice Minister has already announced. And we do hope that the United States will uphold its own rules under Patriot Act, even if somebody unknowingly contributes to an association that supports, that turns out to be associated with terrorist activity actually those are seen guilty anti patriot act so we will see how us apply its own standards but your government or members of your government have gone even further for instance on july the 16th the prime minister bin ali yildirim has said the country that stands behind this man uh, uh, Fethullah Gulen is no friend to Turkey. L the Labour Minister Suleiman Soylu said he believed the Obama administration was behind the coup. I mean, those kind of comments are quite extravagant, aren't they? You know, you're at a risk of seeing a deterioration in your relations with the United States. Uh, listen, I mean, the United States is our ally is our strategic partner, and that has not changed, that will not change. We have disagreement on PYD, YPG. We have disagreements That's on this That's the Syrian Kurdish uh, party movement. that is supported uh, by the Americans, yeah. Yes. That's right. So we have some disagreements, even in families, occasionally but you disagree. But this isn't a disagreement, that Deputy Prime Minister. That... This is actually accusing the United States of somehow being complicit. John Kerry told the Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu in a phone call on Saturday that public insinuations or claims about any role by the United States in the failed coup attempt are utterly false and harmful to our bilateral relations. What would you say to John Kerry? Today, Prime Minister had a press conference. He clarified that and he reiterated our, you know, the importance we attach to our strategic and alliance relationship with the United States. I think that's behind us. But of course, we still expect the United States to live up to its own standards and to help us combat rogue elements 
and terrorism here locally and globally. I think that's a fair expectation. Okay, President Erdogan was apparently on holiday in Mamaris when the coup attempt happened. Um, he flew back to Istanbul. We understand that there were fighter jets trying to target his, uh, his plane. Um, and Lina Khatib from Chatham House says the fact that a coup happened, regardless of who did it, shows us that Erdogan is vulnerable, shows he doesn't have the full support in his state institutions. That is true, isn't it? His grip on power isn't quite what people might think it is. Oh, come on. I mean, President Erdogan's uh, a simple FaceTime call helped take millions and millions of people to the streets that prevented a vicious military coup. And you're telling me that President Erdogan doesn't have a strong, solid footing among people. Well, no, I, I don't I see, sorry, Deputy Erdogan. Prime Minister, I don't see how you can extrapolate from the fact that there were many Turks opposed to the coup were necessarily supporters of Erdogan. There are some Turks, many Turks, who say we don't want the military involved in politics. We want them to remain in their barracks. But you can't say as a result of that that therefore they are all Erdogan supporters. We know they're not. But let me, let me make this argument. I, I personally, you know, uh, think that President Erdogan has proven to be right on how big of a menace this illegal parallel state, these rogue elements, because for years he has been talking about them, he's been going after them, and many people even around him and, and, and in the opposition never believed. And now it has proven that this menace is actually quite a danger to Turkish democracy, to Turkey's future, to Turkey's peaceful You've made you that know, point, uh, but I'm society. making a different so, point, which is that President Erdogan really is not perhaps as strong as we might all think. For example, one of those people arrested in connection with the failed coup is his aide-de-camp, Colonel Al Yazidi, someone who had open access to the president. Some of these arrests are based on some of the information, some of the suspicions. So I think the judiciary is going to look at this, it's going to investigate and pass a judgment. Right now, we're being very cautious. We have to be, because we experienced a, a, a huge event, you know, an extraordinary sure, sure. But please night. do answer my and, question. And, uh, please do answer my question. I'm sorry to interrupt so you, Deputy Prime Minister. His I inner am, circle, no, his no, no, inner but, circle but, could have been involved. Isn't that right? Uh, I can't really judge that because that the, the investigation will uncover that. But let me tell you this. I believe that President Erdogan's standing among Turkish people on a broader political spectrum has strengthened, I think, the support for President Erdogan, even among other political parties, because he's proven right, is he has a much stronger appeal to people. Already he enjoys strong public support. So I would disagree with you to that extent. Yeah, but the fact is we know that the opposition parties in Turkey have come out against the coup and so on, and you always say how much support he has. But, you know, in the November elections, he won 49.4... The AK Party won 49.4% of the vote. So you've got half the Turkish population who didn't support the AK Party and President Erdogan. And my point is you have got to reach out to them. He has got to reach out to them. As the Financial Times said today, Erdogan would do better by his traumatised country to recognise that democracy is not just about winning elections, but the need to show respect and restraint to opponents and build shared support. And that's been lacking. Well, that we, I would agree with you. I think, but I mean, I, that I would agree with you that I think this uh, catalytic event, this, this massive event, hopefully will help us, will serve as a catalyst to actually have reconciliation domestically, to actually, and in fact, there was an extraordinary session of Turkish parliament where I personally am very encouraged by very constructive statements. So maybe, maybe this will help Turkey get, change junta designed constitution. Maybe this will help Turkey you know, reduce polarization, ease domestic political tension. President Erdogan has already called 
the leaders of opposition, thanking them for their stance against the military coup. This is a good start. And therefore, I believe that you know, going forward with so many people out there from different parts of political sort of, I mean, from different walks of life, I think it's a good sign that maybe we are about to sort of embark just where we did on international affairs with Russia, with Israel, to actually start a process of reconciliation domestically. So when you said to make Turkey less polarized, I put it to you that the most polarizing figure in Turkish politics is President Erdogan. You either love him or you hate him. Is he not now, frankly, a liability for the ruling AK Party? Would it perhaps not be in the national interest, in the interest of your party, Deputy Prime Minister, if the president were to say, look, a lot of the criticisms, the failed coup was very much directed at me personally, Erdogan. I'm going to move on. I completely disagree with you. If Turkish democracy is where it is today, if Turkish economy has achieved this strong performance, it's largely on the back of President Erdogan when he was prime minister, his progressive platform, his reforms, his outreach to addressing Kurdish issue and many other issues. So I disagree with you. I think President Erdogan has been reformist has had a progressive platform and he's been spot on on these rogue state, rogue elements or whatever pilots. I think vast majority of people are now recognizing and appreciating his stance over the last few years. Last couple well, of years it, have been very difficult sure. period. You, we had two elections, uh, if I may please, we had two elections in 2014, two elections in 2015. There's been a lot of domestic noise and he has personally been targeted by this illegal movement that today is committing all sorts of atrocities. Right. So let's face it, I think a lot of people now will appreciate how right President Erdogan has been. You said that he's had progressive reformist policies. You are the Deputy Prime Minister in charge of the economy. And yes, the AK Party has done a lot for those uh, more impoverished parts of Turkish society. But honestly, tell me, does it look good when President Erdogan builds a palace at around $700 million, a 1,000 rooms, apparently 250 of those rooms for his own personal use? That is on the BBC website from the Ankara arm of the Chamber of Architects. What does that look like when you say, oh, he's helped the poor? You know... The rate of absolute poverty was 30% in 2002 when President Erdogan became Prime Minister. It's down to less than 2% today. But does he need a palace? And does so he need that palace? If, well, let, 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 me, but let, me, let me ask you this. You know, the repair bill for a House of Commons, you know, is five billion uh, but that's pounds. not just used by you're one person. About a few okay, hundred, so you're justifying you're talk, it. You're no, justifying you're his about palace. A few hundred million. No, 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 no. Okay. The, um, this is not about his palace. Okay. Nobody is going to last forever. President Erdogan is not going to last forever. This palace is Turkey's real estate. All right. Is Turkish government's real estate. Very, very quickly, people are willing Turkey to succeed. It's a pivotal nation in a tough neighborhood. Will you now see stability in your country? Very quickly. Absolutely. Democracy has won. Democracy will be strengthened. Domestic reconciliation is underway. Okay. Domestic tensions will ease. And yes, people have won. And I think we'll do everything to yep. make people happy, creating jobs and doing that structural reforms. Deputy Prime Minister Mehmet Şimşek in Ankara, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk.